Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of VMware's Partnership Perspectives. I'm Kathleen Tandy, Vice President of Global Partner and Alliances Marketing at VMware, and I'm pleased to bring you the stories and trends from VMware industry analysts, partners, and executives from around the world. Today, I'm joined by Chris Wolf, Chief Research and Innovation Officer at VMware. Chris is responsible for driving ahead of roadmap invention and co-innovation, aligning new technologies to VMware's R&D business units, and continuously pursuing cutting edge research to solve customers' most pressing challenges. Together, we discussed how Chris and his team collaborate with VMware partners and customers at the start of early R&D technology opportunities and how partners play an important role throughout the innovation process from design and product development to our go-to-market strategy. Enjoy the full conversation now. Chris, welcome to Partnership Perspectives. I am so excited to have you join us today. Thanks, Kathleen. I really like working with our partners and helping our partner community, so I'm really excited to be here. That's great. One of the reasons I'm so excited to have you join us is that I've had the opportunity to hear you speak with so many groups over your tenure at VMware with our customers, with our partners at events like Empower, and our communities, including the VMware user group. And over the years, you have such a great ability to both see and communicate complex technology trends and really help communicate them in ways that make them really accessible concepts that promote deeper understanding which is probably now why you've taken this new role as Chief Research and Innovation Officer for VMware. So let's start with that new role. For those who may not be familiar, particularly because it is a new role, can you give us a quick overview of this role, the organization, and how it's designed to drive impact on the future of VMware? Sure. I think you know, one way to think about it is it's kind of a classic office of the CTO. It's really taken the what had been the existing VMware office of the CTO and really rebranded as the research and innovation organization because we've had the bigger charter in the CTO office. And really, when people say, what is your most important KPI? For me, it's really quite simple. It's technology transfers. It's all about incubating and building important technologies in partnership with our partners, our customers, and our R&D business units that go to product and really impact VMware's bottom line, creates opportunities for our partners as well. And we do this through advanced development, through programs such as X-Labs, have a cloud architecture team, we're doing innovation and open source. And then on the far end, we are taking very large bets in some of our moonshots in the research organization. So all of this collectively, to me, amounts to being able to ideally transfer technology, at least four transfers per quarter is what I'm shooting for in the organization. And for the folks out there that have seen VMworld and the VMworld Vision and Innovation Keynote, you got to see a preview of a lot of that work that's been happening and what's to come. That's great. So I think having a chief innovation officer seems to be a new trend for many companies. Kind of like the chief information security officer that we started seeing be this new role in the C-suite, probably now, what, six, seven, eight years ago. I'm curious as to why do you think this role is starting to take hold across all sorts of companies, across all sorts of industries? It's starting to take hold because innovation in itself is really important. And Organizations that can, or you know, even software companies or end user organizations or partner organizations that can have a dedicated group and accountability around organic innovation, that can make a huge difference for, for the business. And that's really why I think you know, Ragu and, and Kit and others have tapped me for this role is my focus when we had formed even the advanced technology group was A, how do we innovate and how we innovate, I think was probably the most important thing. And that boiled down to taking this collaborative or co-innovation approach. For us, just as an example, when we start to really accelerate development of a particular project and build something that will go into product, we go as far as talking to the BU that the project would be transferred into, understanding where they prefer to have their engineers staffed, what are the development tools that they use, what are the processes that they have. We align ourselves to their tools and processes, and we do that on a per project basis. So sometimes when people say, how do you become more efficient in engineering and what you do? I say, well, actually, we're intentionally inefficient and we do it for a really important reason. I'm curious, when you say intentionally inefficient, what do you mean by that? 
would be easy just to say, we're going to have a central tool to manage all of our engineering projects, and we're going to have a single set of processes. That's what most people would do. That's the textbook thing to do. But we take a customer service approach. We say, if we're going to move something into our networking and security business, we look at the specific tools and processes that they have, and we align our projects to those so that it makes the technology transfer really fluid because it already aligns to what how the BU prefers to operate. You know, that's a great thing for us and I think for the BUs. And I would say how we try to redefine innovation also is you see a lot of other tech vendors where they incubate lots of projects and they, quote, graduate the incubated project and declare victory. And to us, that's it's a meaningless metric because unless we're actually shipping the software that we built in the CTO office, we didn't achieve anything at the end of the day. So for us, it's about if we do a prototype, it's very early just to demonstrate that we can do something. After that, all of the work we do is fully aligned to the business unit, and it's architecturally and code compatible with how they want to ship a product. So we don't graduate prototypes. We graduate typically late stage alpha or early beta code that is on a fast track to becoming product and getting to market really quickly. So is it fair to say that the role in the organization that you're leading has these two halves? One is building a process end to end to be able to help transfer the technology or the, these new learnings that you're innovating in your team and thinking about how you take it all the way through and get it adopted by not only the business groups through to that customer and our partners, but also playing a role though in having that telescope that's looking far out to the future and watching what those trends are and making the bets for the company. So kind of like those two halves, is that a fair way to think about it? Yeah, we're looking out, we're placing strategic bets that we think are going to be really important and can contribute to the bottom line of, you know, not just VMware, but our partners and customers. We're then accelerating development of those things to get them into product as quickly as possible. I like to try to move things from inception to product in less than two years, wherever possible. The other side of it is uh, there's another philosophy I constantly harp on within the organization, which is continuous calibration. We want to always be obsessed about what we're not thinking about. So it's really important in very early stage R&D to socialize our work and get feedback from our customers and partners. And that, that opens up opportunities to often find design partners. And in some cases with some of our partners, actually line them up as go-to-market partners as we further development in some of these projects. That's great. So I want to have the opportunity to talk about both halves of that coin, but let's dig in a little bit more into the future, right? Both from a customer and a partner standpoint. What are some of the, as you look at the trends and I'm sure rooted in VMware's multi-cloud and apps, modern apps and our cross-cloud services strategy that we just came out with and talked a lot about at VMworld, as, as you referenced, what is the approach that you're taking across your team to look at the future, identify the future? What are some of the practices you use? How do you work with our customers? How do you work with our partners to identify what those bets are? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. It's certainly very nuanced. The first part of it is understanding what are VMware's corporate priorities? Where are we going? What does VMware's future look like? And then aligning the bets we're placing to the most strategic areas to VMware as a company. To put it bluntly, we're, we're not a charity. We don't want to just innovate for innovation's sake. We want to innovate for things that will matter to VMware at the end of the day. So part of that is from the top down is aligning on the themes. So where does VMware need the biggest help really from a, an innovation organization? And these are areas like modern applications, very strategic for VMware. We need to be able to sell solutions to customers that are full stack that can really solve their business problems. And that, that's everything from the modern application data platforms to the apps and services that can run on them. And we're not saying that we wanna write all of this ourselves, but it's important for our customers and partners to see examples of what good looks like, and then they can innovate around that. I think that really helps them in terms of some of those next steps. So it's modern apps, it's edge computing. There's work we're doing in security. There's a lot of work we're doing in machine learning as well. There's work we're doing around sustainable engineering. And then finally, I'd say multi-cloud is the other key investment theme we have. So when we can get alignment and say, here are the targets, then we can look at some really far out things in areas around security that can be important to customers. We are already doing incubation work in edge computing where we have a mobile fellow cloud edge where we're running software-defined WAN and modern applications for first responders. 
And I, I've talked with a, a friend of mine. I mean, I've known this guy since kindergarten. He's a police officer in the United States. And I was telling him about this project and he was really excited about it because what we can do is reliably offer a video feed from car cameras as well as body cameras back to a central location, which is either for human observation or even for machine learning and AI based intelligence to understand just awareness of what's happening. And this police officer friend of mine said, well, that's really amazing from a safety perspective, because sometimes when I'm in an incident, I can't even reach my microphone, basically, or my CB or whatever to be able to call for backup or assistance. So these are things that they're excited about. And we ha we currently have a police department in Europe that is testing the solution on 50,000 cars. So this is VMR technology in a first responder use case at very large scale. That's an example of some of the work. And again, I think the important thing for us is in a lot of these cases, we're trying to lay a foundation, build a platform and seed adoption, but then be very deliberate and say, this is VMware's piece. And here's everything above and around the stack, which are areas where our partners are able to add value and innovate to. Well, and I know that partners have also been a source of thinking about opportunities for innovation and research as well. Are there any examples that you could share of how you engaged with some of VMware's partners to think about those future-oriented solutions and how you've then brought them back into your organization? Yeah, I think there's a couple of ways. First, I, I have regular stand-ups with a lot of the CXOs that are partners, and this is a great forum for us to compare notes and swap ideas and really explore opportunities. More specifically, some of the work that we've recently been doing in innovations around edge computing. I've been working with Mike Taylor, the CTO of Worldwide Technologies, and his teams have been working directly with a lot of our innovation teams. That's been terrific engagement where we have mutual customers, we have mutual interest, and Together, we're able to compare notes and really align on the right architecture and, and doing so in a way that's making sure that we're not going too far and we're building even things like the right APIs and SDKs that are what our partners need to be able to innovate around these new solutions. So engaging them really early in the R&D process, right, in very early stage development gives us a chance that when we are bringing these new products to market, they're already aligned to what our partners require. Do you have a, or are you thinking about a systematic way to engage with more partners? I'm sure as partners are listening to this, there might be a number of them that are thinking, I would like to you know, share notes and compare. I'm curious how you are setting it up. You're not a huge team. You, Chris, only have a certain number of hours in the day to meet and talk with you know, CXOs around the globe. How are you thinking about wanting to make yourself available for partners who want to have those conversations with you? Yeah, either myself or my team, we try to meet as, as often as possible. I was one, but I, I think the most important thing is when there's something specific that we can align towards, that's really what's important to me. I don't like having the meeting to say, well, the meeting is all about getting to the next meeting. Well, no, that, that actually, that's horrible. That's not a good outcome if you just got one more meeting from your meeting. When you can say, we're going to do something specific together on federated machine learning, and we're going to look at this with these technologies and these edge use cases. Or a partner can say, sure, you know what? I really see the use of running modern applications on an SD-WAN device and doing edge consolidation. And we think that we can actually write these type of network or security function applications that would add more incremental customer value or fill in the blank, right? There's lots of these opportunities. So we're doing a couple of things also that I think is important. We literally just had a meeting on this today, me and several folks in the team which is we're currently building a PowerPoint presentation that is co-innovation opportunities that we will now take in partner meetings. This is something we can scale. So if I'm not available, some of the other innovation leaders in the organization will be able to take forward. Oh, you mentioned size of the organization. Yeah, we are pretty small. We're about 300 people. We partner with other engineers and other aspects of the BUs, but we're roughly a 300 person organization. Of those 300 people, more than 250 are engineers are in engineering roles. So we're very heavily tilted in that regard, and we're always looking to do something specific. So when we meet, though, we will have a more curated way to communicate all of the different innovations that we're doing. And this can help our partners to say, OK, I can kind of see it. I want to talk more about this. And this also means our partner teams can also now socialize this with their direct relationships. And that can also help, I think, to make this a far more efficient process for all of us. Well, that looks great. And we'll look forward to helping you, Chris, and your team be able to share that out with our partners, help them know how they can connect with you. I know that as we are evolving our business model and our strategy, 
Our partners are going to play a critical role in that joint innovation, in building with us, what, you know, building new services, building new capabilities for our customers that embed and include our technology. And I know they're on the front lines every day and with customers and have those great ideas. And I know that there's a lot of joint innovation opportunity in, in store. So happy to help out with that as you're ready to scale. I want to switch now to the second half of your organization's brain, which is around kind of instituting a culture of innovation, the process of innovation for end to end. And in the past, you've spoken about the importance of creating a culture of innovation. From your perspective, what are the key elements of a culture of innovation for VMware or any other company? Although I think just about every company is becoming a technology company now or needs to be and should be approaching it. But what do you think embodies a culture of innovation for whether it is a IT vendor or one of our partners as they're thinking about evolving their business and taking it forward? At the high level, some of this is relatively simple. The, the key themes that I like to really embed in our culture is number one, being outcomes focused, being very specific on what is the problem you're trying to solve and you know, making sure that that's truly aligned to a customer problem. And then working backwards from the problem statement on what is the right technology solution. Sometimes we can get lost, even a company as large as VMware, where we look at what is the most convenient thing for VMware to do next, right? Which may not be convenient for our customers or partners. And then you wind up building things that aren't very useful in, in a lot of cases, or you're solving the wrong problem, or you're trying to solve a problem that doesn't really exist, or at least only in your eyes, maybe you, you wish it did, but it doesn't, right? So being outcomes focused is one, continuous calibration, against needs and continually challenging your assumptions and also not being afraid to shut things down. I think that's it's really important as well. Along those lines, though, the other key aspect for us where we feel we've been really innovating and how we innovate is around co-innovation. Every project we do, we ensure that we have true alignment with the R&D team that would ultimately ship and sell it. We're really direct on what we will do and what we won't do. We don't try to reinvent the wheel with go-to-market or any of that or support. Those are existing VU functions. I don't want to invest in that because doing that kind of work means that's less things I get to build. That's not a good use of our time. But then on the engineering side, for every project we do, we ensure that we have a product manager in the BU that's working with us directly on the project. And we typically have a very senior engineer or architect as well that's also aligned to the project. And if they can throw in some engineers to help us, great. If not, that's okay. We can handle that function. So when we have the alignment, that means that anything that we're starting to work on is going to be architecturally and code compatible with what the business unit wants to ship. And it's a really important step because now we're not building a prototype. We're actually building the product that they're going to move to market. And in some cases, we've been able to produce some groundbreaking technology on how you can do, you can split an application and remote it to any hardware accelerator. It's called Project Radium, and we introduced it at VMworld. That was an example of technology that we've went from inception to being able to move into product in 12 months. The BU alignment allowed that to happen because it's, again, it's already going right into our vSphere code and that makes a huge difference. Something else I'll mention to give you another story of an innovation project this year is we had been building technology that was doing some dynamic discovery for carbon black. We thought it was pretty important stuff and was going to really help the product. But the BU and the product management team's priorities shifted and they said, we can no longer support this or offer people to support it. And I said, all right, peace out. We're done. We're shutting it down. So we literally shut the project down in a span of two weeks. We said, we're out when you really want to engage and you think this is meaningful for you. Great. And again, that team is our customer. Who are we to tell them that we're smarter than them? If they don't think they want this technology, we're not going to build it. And because of that, there's something else that we did build, which was amazing, which is we can now do modular cryptography in our Workspace ONE Unified Access Gateway product. And we're building a way to, for our customers and partners to build their own crypto agile applications. We announced that at VMworld, and we were only able to announce it because we shut down one security project and we put everybody on another one. And we had some great breakthroughs there. It worked out to be a good outcome, but you have to have that kind of discipline. I love that story. And I'm curious, as you are leading this team, I know engineers are creative people. Some people may not think that, but I think of engineers as very creative people who can get attached to some of these projects and wanting to see them go through. And there might be some resistance to not wanting to shut it down because they're attached. How do you manage the psychology of managing your teams to be able to allow them to dive in, but be able to let go when they need to and be able to shift? You have to really start that from the top. And that is one of the other key attributes, I think, to being successful in innovation is having no pride of ownership. You want to be able to 
really what I like to do is coach people to look at two different paths. If you're so passionate about a project and we're going to move it now to a business unit to start to ship it, you can move too. You can be a part of the project. If you want to apply your expertise to a new problem, then that's awesome too. So I think that that's really the key is that setting the culture that there are plenty of problems to work on. There's plenty of problems we can solve. We don't have to have ownership of them. And as soon as another team wants to take on something, then that's great because now we can go work on something else. That's a good outcome for us as an organization. You just get that too much in technology where people truly believe that their idea is better and therefore they just need to follow it around and everything else. But if somebody else is doing something that's 80 or 90 percent there and it's good enough, maybe it's not as architecturally pure as you might like it to be. Who freaking cares? Right. Let's let it go. There's other problems to solve. And, and, and when people have that culture, it matters. And the other thing about this, too, is if you do innovation right, you can really democratize innovation because sometimes the centers of gravity for where innovation comes from, in, in a lot of cases, even in VMware's case, it had been too U.S. centric. And when you start to create a culture where anybody can contribute to the innovation process and anybody has a true chance to lead innovation, you're creating career opportunities for people in every part of the world that they might not get. And at the same time, because they're seeing these opportunities, they're staying at VMware and they're they're doing bigger things and they're growing their careers in ways that they may not be able to do in other places. I love that concept of democratizing innovation because I'm sure that if your philosophy, Chris, takes hold, it can permeate, frankly, beyond the research and innovation team, but really take hold across the entire company. And everybody can think about opportunities to be able to innovate because with the pace of our transformation, everybody's transforming the acceleration of digital transformation across the board. I think all companies need the minds of everybody and thinking in an innovative way. A hundred percent. And if you look at the way our organization is comprised, not only are we a global organization, but we're a very diverse organization. We're close to, I think, around 40 percent in terms of team members that are women and underrepresented minorities in the company. And we really see our diversity as our strength. That gives us a, a real good breadth of ideas and, and perspectives that you normally wouldn't see. And I, I really attribute a lot of that to the success that we've had. Absolutely. I think diversity has absolutely been shown to be a key element of driving innovation. Sometimes it might take longer, but you absolutely get better results in the process. You've been quoted recently in a white paper that we published, and I know we've made it available for our our partners, that focuses on adopting flexibility as a design principle to fuel that innovation. What is this? What is flexibility as a design principle? What does that mean? How do you design in flexibility? Why is it important? And how could that approach help our partners in thinking about how they approach solving their customers' problems? Yeah, if you think about the business climate today, it really boils down to, in many cases, velocity and agility. How quickly can we move? How quickly can we pivot? When you think about flexibility as a design principle, to me, it it comes down to building apps and services with the expectation of change in mind. And I think COVID really showed us that in a far more meaningful and powerful way where we had some of our customers that had to do pretty miraculous things like a lab testing company that won a federal contract and they had to roll out 200 different testing sites across the United States in a matter of a couple of weeks. And they were successful because they had a architecture that was built a lot on our technologies that allowed them to do that. They didn't have any external dependencies that would have gotten in their way. You know, there's retailers I've worked with that they had to literally move distribution centers to to different states in the U.S. because of local COVID restrictions and things like that. This massive shift to being able to work from home, you know, unexpected. You know, think about VMware. We pivoted nearly 40,000 employees to a full work from home model in a matter of like a week. Technologies like Workspace ONE really helped with that. So when you think about it from a partner or a customer perspective, what are the technologies you're using from the apps down to the infrastructure that allow you to be able to truly pivot or grow or change on a moment's notice? And how quickly can you do that? That's often can determine whether businesses survive or don't survive when changes happen. It may not be a global pandemic. It might be some new threat to the business that you just weren't expecting or weren't planning for. And you need to do a very quick pivot. And how can you do that? From our perspective, that comes down to truly having a software-defined infrastructure layer from compute to memory to storage to networks and so forth really help you because you can have that consistent operations no matter where an application runs. And if you 
might need to run an application in one place one day, but it changes tomorrow because of a new acquisition that the company makes or, again, new line of business that you're looking to pursue or whatever it might be. And that's really the thinking even behind our Tanzu portfolio is you're going to have flexibility now to be able to build an application and run it anywhere. But containers only get you so far, right? They, they can let you run an application anywhere, but you can't necessarily operate it anywhere and do it so consistently with the same tools and processes. So that's where when you can start to combine container-based solutions and Kubernetes with a true software-defined infrastructure fabric, you can truly start to architect to build once, run and operate anywhere. And as changes happen, which they will, you're going to be able to very quickly pivot. And that's something that I think is really core to the strengths and the value that we can provide to customers, to us and our partners. So it sounds like designing for flexibility is designing with the principle in mind that things will change and that you need to design for inherent evolutions and try to anticipate even looking several steps down how the situation the use can change and just plan for that. That's exactly it. If you have the opportunity and you're building new applications and services, why not future-proof them from the very beginning if you have the opportunity to do so? Especially if it's not even really adding to the cost. You know, why wouldn't you do that? And that's, that's how we think about it. That's great. I think that's a great approach for all of our partners to think about, because I know every day they're in the business of trying to solve their customers' problems and incorporating that type of approach is only going to make them more valuable advisors for their customers as they help coach their customers to think about designing for flexibility, designing to future-proof in mind as well. So great advice there. When we think about innovation, I'm sure there are a lot of people think about disruptive innovations the things that are going to change the course. And all of us certainly, whether we wanted to or not, had a major disruptor last year. We're still living with disruption, which is accelerated. And sometimes technology comes along. And I'm sure you've been part of virtualization, which was one, which was a massive disruptor and then accelerator in terms of innovation. And then there is sustaining innovation, which is probably small incremental innovations over time. How as you look at which projects you choose to work on, how you work on your achieving your four technology transfers a quarter, how do you think about balancing the disruptors with the sustaining and work them into your innovation portfolio? Truly, most disruptive projects or technologies often are so disruptive and so different that they wouldn't even align to an existing business unit. And if you look at VMware blockchain, which is seeing really good traction right now, that's a good example of that. And the way I've guided the organization is to think about, can probably do one or two of those at a time and and feel good about it. And the reason I say one or two is because they're so large and so complex that doing a blockchain business, as an example, means that I'm not able to do innovation projects that could be six other adjacencies to existing businesses. And those adjacencies could be new products those existing businesses would sell. And there's actually a third part of this, too. So there's having enough adjacencies in the portfolio, which is a majority of what we do, having those bigger, more disruptive bets. And again, at the incubation stage, so from when we go from research to incubation, really to more advanced development and products. So when we kind of in that middle stage, I like to have maybe a couple of those in the portfolio at a time with leaders. Typically, this is even at the VP level that are fully accountable for the success and failures of those projects. And then again, on the far end, we're taking much a larger amount of chances. You know, the research organization, the way I've guided them is if they're successful on 20% of the things that they're doing, that's a great number and we'll take it. If it's a lot higher than that, then that means we're probably not being risky enough in, in terms of research and the things that we're taking on. The incubation work, I think we can be about 50% successful. And then when we get into advanced development, because we're aligning our projects and we're getting sponsorship from our existing lines of business, we can be in the neighborhood of 80% success there. And there's one other thing I do want to mention that we're doing. This is our partners can also take advantage of this, is we formed a new team a year ago called the Accelerated Co-Innovation Engineering Team. And what they do is a head of roadmap innovation, where in a lot of cases, a partner might be working with a customer and they're trying to close a large deal. And the customer's like, you know, I really need this integration or this feature. And product management might say, yep, we agree with you. We want to build it, but we probably can't get to it for a year. We actually formed a new team that can do advanced development in support of our customers and partners to help them close deals. One of our most recent successes was we worked with a very large shipping company that needed a specific integration with vRealize Automation 8 and Puppet at the time. What happened was the team met with them. We realized, okay, yep, this is something that our cloud management business unit absolutely wants to support. 
They don't have the resources to do it now. This team wrote the integration. We had, just to give you even a timeline for this, the customer asked for this to close a deal in December of last year. This feature was shipping in product in March of this year. So statement of work to shipping in product in like four months. And, and this is a new way to, again, to a new service that we can provide with our partners to help accelerate some of the deals that they're trying to close when they have a particular deal blocker. That, again, is something that we already want to do. You just need resources to help with it. It's an advanced development SWAT team. I see them ready to go to hide in, and I'm sure you're embodying all the agile design principles to be able to work in these sprints to be able to hit. That's a pretty amazing track record in terms of being able to deliver that in four months. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And these sprints we're doing daily standups, we're really moving at a very quick pace and, and making sure that we're checking in. Even when the customer is involved in this co-innovation, we're usually checking with them a couple times a week. Ultimately, VMware is getting a feature we were going to build anyway, and the customer is making sure it really aligns to the look and feel that they would like. Chris, along with sustaining innovation and disrupting innovation, there's probably another source of innovation, which is acquisition. So it's buying innovation, and VMware has a long history. I've lost count of how many different businesses we've acquired over the 12 years I've been part of the company because it's a lot. But that's also another way that we keep track of and we focus on innovation. How does your team get involved in kind of our thinking about our acquisitions and the role of potentially absorbing investments in third parties into our innovation roadmap? In many cases, we're a part of the exploration and the diligence process. That's uh, typically where we get involved is to really make sure that it is the right technology fit. It's the right skill sets within the organization. It really aligns to what we're trying to do. There's not sufficient overlap with maybe something else that we're already building organically that maybe one of our lines of business wasn't aware of. So it's really looking at all of these different areas and does it make sense to acquire is kind of how we go about it in areas that are very strategic to the company. And I think overall, if you look at VMware, our track record of being able to integrate acquisitions is actually quite remarkable compared to a lot of our peers. Actually, do we pursue a strategy of joint technology innovation with other companies as part of our innovation strategy? We do a lot of it, actually, but we don't disclose who the, <laughs> who the companies are. That's the challenge with that. So we do a lot of investments in companies and on the board of one of the companies that we're investing in. We make sure that we're doing really good collaborative work. And that's also, I'd say that we do a lot more of that, actually, than direct acquisitions. And it tends to work out pretty well for us. Oh, Interesting. Actually, how about then in terms of the sensitive nature? Let me just ask you the question from a perspective of, do we also use that as a strategy? And you can just say, yes, but we don't disclose it. It's however top secret. Chris, joint technology ventures are also another way that we can help drive innovation. Is this something that, well, first of all, that VMware does, something that your team is involved in? And is there anything that you can share that's coming in the future? Yeah, Kathleen, I think there's a couple parts of this. So there is a lot of organizations that we'll invest in that we, we don't disclose publicly, but we really work with them to kind of shape our technology future. And they, they could lead to future acquisitions. But then we also are doing an increasing number of joint innovation labs with partners as well. And that led to a lot of great outcomes as well. One of my side jobs is co-chairing the joint innovation lab that we've run with IBM and Red Hat. And there has been some outstanding synergies and joint technologies that we've built between us that have really benefited both companies. What I have asked the team to do is to take really the learnings from that, Jill, and start to think more broadly how we can scale this to not just technology partners, but our SI partners as well. It's something that I'm really, I think is important and would like us to double down on as a company. That's really exciting to hear. I know having talked to many of our partners, they can bring those ideas and I'm sure they're even you mentioned a few, IBM Red Hat, some of our global systems integrators. I know there are more out there. So it's also great to hear that overall your team is engaging with partners, looking for those ideas, because I'm sure there are even more who want to engage and talk about co-innovation. Yeah, and let me give you one more example real quick, too. We announced Tanzu Bring Your Own Host at VMworld. Why that really matters to partners is we're really clear about this. We have a lot of partners where Operating systems and infrastructure and all of that management is really part of their core practice. So with Bring Your Own Host, it literally means that the partner owns from the OS on down, doesn't even have to have a hypervisor if they choose not to. They manage all of that. We manage from the Tanzu layer up. So it's a solution that's great for VMware. It's great for our partners. 
you can totally architect any way that you want. And then again, when that's your core practice, that creates a lot of opportunity for you. So if you haven't looked at that, that's also another good opportunity to look at how you can partner more closely with VMware. I love that. And hopefully they can find it on VMware.com. Otherwise, we'll make sure that our partners are aware of how they can get access because that sounds like a really exciting way to get involved with Tanzu and with modern application developments for their customers. Chris, over the last 20 months, we've all dealt with lots of changes. It's continuing as we are continuing to live in this interesting hybrid work environment. I'm curious, you've been at the hub of innovation, which I know has been an exciting place to be because the last 20 months have done nothing except accelerate digital transformation, technology complexity across the entire technology stack of our customers. So it's probably a little bit been in the eye of the hurricane for you, yet you've remained a steady presence with your team navigating changes through the company. Curious how your leadership style, how you've been personally challenged as a leader, how you've grown and how have you emerged now out of the last 20 months differently than where we all were in March of last year? Yeah, I think in in some ways we've been fortunate. When I first formed the advanced technology group at VMware, we had a philosophy that we were really just hiring talent based on ability, not on location. So we were setting ourselves up as a fairly global engineering organization with a lot of folks that were working from home already. So we kind of had a head start on some of this, and I think that helps quite a bit in terms of our own evolution would be one area. If I go back, though, to really answer your question, though, in terms of how I've changed as a leader, the biggest thing for me has been letting go. And it's really important to be able to move quickly into scale. And how do you do that? To me, it's, it's really simple. It's you find people that you really trust and you empower them to be successful. You get out of their way. For some of my product managers and innovation leads, I've literally asked the question, what do you need to be successful? What are the things you need? And it's like, okay, I trust you. You're telling me this is what you need. I'm going to make it happen for you. That's my job. My other job is really just to to checkpoint people and to ask questions and say, well, is this really aligned or is this a, aligned to the right customer outcome? Or is this more important than these other projects and trying to calibrate there? When you start out as a pure technologist and you grow into a technology leader, I think the hardest problem we all have is feeling that if we become too high level, we kind of lose our street cred. Like we're not looked on or respected by our technology peers. And that is definitely a struggle where I have folks with highly advanced PhDs and disciplines that I can only dream of working for me and understanding that I even deserve to be able to manage them and have them on my team is something that I think we all probably struggle with. But it's really having people's back and understanding how you can really give people good advice and and be a good mentor and and leader for them. And and I think finally, I would just say is not being afraid to, to just say, hey, I don't know. I have no idea. That's a great question. And being just really honest with yourself about what you know and not know and and not feeling that you have to be insecure, or even if you're leading an organization, you have to have every answer because that's just impossible. And knowing who to talk to or getting those answers is what matters more. Chris, I think those are great insights, whether you're a technology leader, a business leader, a line of business leader. I think having people's back and setting your people up for success are great principles across the board. As you're describing that, one of the other topics that continues to come up, particularly as I speak with partners, is the war for talent. We're seeing lots of shifts. We're seeing people needing to hold on. People, I've heard one leader call it crispy, right, as we're continuing this. I'm going to imagine that you are probably seeing relatively low attrition because of the leadership style that you are driving, which makes it an environment where people want to come to work. Yeah, it makes a huge difference. For us, it's been about, A, having really interesting projects to work on, having a really welcoming and inclusive culture where people feel really well respected by their peers, doing a lot of work around mentorship and pipeline development and seeing people get promoted and really championing their work and uh, being an advocate for them as well. These all make a huge difference. We've had extremely low attrition over the past several years and a compliment to the culture that we've built and the type of work we're doing, I think combined those matter. And I tell people all the time, there's going to be other tech companies that are going to beat us on compensation, but I'll be damned. They are not going to beat us on culture. They just won't. And I I feel really strongly about that. That's great. And again, I'm not surprised that people are sticking with the organization because what a great opportunity to practice 
a culture of innovation and getting to invent every day. That's one thing I think VMware is really good at is always focused on what's next and, and inventing. So Chris, let's wrap up and shift gears a little bit with some fun questions, just some rapid fire questions. What are you reading or listening to right now? Yeah, I just finished, uh, I guess I'm reading the Michaels right now. So I just finished uh, Mike Hayes' latest book. As a former U.S. Marine, I can relate to a lot of his military stories. I thought that was excellent. Next up for me, probably no surprise, is Michael Dell's latest book, which I'm really excited about as well. I mean, as I've gotten to know Michael Dell as a person, he's just a phenomenal human being, brilliant mind and brilliant technologist. And again, that's next up for me. I'm going to have a flight at the end of the week, and I'm looking forward to diving into that one. Great. I'm sure you have also been working in this new hybrid model over the last 18, 20 months. I'm assuming you're mostly working from home since most of VMware is working from home still. What has been your favorite aspect of getting to work from home? And although I don't know, actually, Chris, whether you worked from home before or whether this is the change, but what's been the favorite part of this hybrid model for you? The favorite thing is this pandemic has put so much stress on families and people my daughter's on the high school volleyball team. So I can stop my day, I can block a couple hours, and I can leave and go see her volleyball game. That's awesome. And then I can get back to work. So I can be very productive, but I can do it on my terms and really be even more involved with my family if I was on a plane all the time or commuting to offices and, and things like that. That's great. I've heard a lot of stories of people being able to have a little more downtime and, and absolutely being able to spend more time with people that they didn't expect to, which is wonderful. Who is someone that inspires you every day and, and helps keep you going either personally or professionally? There's definitely a lot. I would say one of my biggest inspirations is Dr. Martin Luther King. I have a copy of a Ebony magazine that was published just shortly after his death that sits across from my desk. And I look at that every day and I still get inspiration from Dr. King. He's been someone that just matters to me because I think he's an advocate for people and for change. And if you think about a lot of what we do at work, even at VMware, it's, it's the same thing. It's about taking care of our people. It's making everyone feel included and important because they do being able to drive pretty amazing changes. So he's, I'd say, probably top of the list for me in terms of people that really matter. Great. And lastly, Chris, what keeps you inspired about working in technology, a career in technology, and its promise for the future? What keeps me going is it's kind of funny. Like when I was in high school, I used to think like, how can I get a job in engineering and invention? It's like everything's already been invented. You know, what am I going to do? And I'm like, wow, you know, looking back on that, I was like, well, I was so naive. There's new things every single day. And I, to me, that's what's most exciting is that you can really drive some meaningful change and really make the world a better place. And it's not just words. You can actually do something about it. And to me, that's the most exciting thing, that you're driving change and helping people to do better things. And even technologies we build, right, that help people so that they can spend more time with their families and have a better balance between work and life and making that easier for them to do these things. That matters. And that's reason enough to get out of bed, I think. Well, I love that. And that's a great place, I think, for us to wrap up. Because at the end of the day, Chris, I think one of the big takeaways for me from our conversation is there are a lot of principles to be able to embody, to democratize innovation, to be able to make its principles available to help solve problems and help solve real problems. But at the end of the day, it's solving problems for people. It's about solving problems to help connect people and drive impact that make a difference in people's lives. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate the conversation. Yeah, thanks for the time, Kathleen. What a fantastic conversation with Chris. It was great learning more about the importance of creating a culture of innovation and how together VMware and our partners are collaborating to develop joint innovations and future-oriented solutions to meet customers' business goals. I hope you enjoyed this great conversation too. To learn more about VMware, please visit VMware.com. To connect with Chris, you can find him on LinkedIn or on Twitter at at CSWolf. Thanks for joining me on this episode. Remember to subscribe, follow, and review VMware Partnership Perspectives podcast from your streaming platform of choice. For more information on VMware's partner programs, please visit Partner Executive Edge at VMware.com. I'm Kathleen Tandy. Thanks for listening and hope to see you next time.